Hello, I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Thank you for joining us today. Our guest in studio is Cindy Perlin. Now, Cindy's a licensed clinical social worker, a certified biofeedback practitioner, a chronic pain survivor, and past president of the Northeast Regional Biofeedback Society. In addition, she's also the author of the best-selling book, The Truth About Chronic Pain Treatments, The Best and Worst Strategies for Becoming Pain-Free. And she's returning with us today to talk about some of the recent legislation that has taken place uh, during this uh, this election here in the United States and also marijuana legislation in the United Kingdom and Australia as well. And how legislation is affecting patient access across the board. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, you've been doing uh, some research and, and actively involved in the, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, getting the awareness out about the effectiveness and safety of mar- marijuana and its use for chronic pain. Now, you're a chronic pain survivor and, and um, a licensed clinical social worker. Talk a bit about how your experience with chronic pain landed you as a an expert in dealing with chronic pain. Social workers have a lot to offer in terms of treating chronic pain because it's a it's a mind body phenomenon. So you have to really approach it by both ends if you want to recover from it. So um, I, as I said, was a chronic pain survivor. And I, uh, when I was 25 years old, I hurt my back running and things got worse and worse till I couldn't function at all. And I um, ended up spending three and a half years unable to function in agonizing pain. The doctors were useless. The drugs they gave me didn't help and had side effects that were intolerable and potential risks that were unacceptable. And I was in despair. I didn't know what to do. And I stumbled upon a book talking about the mind-body connection, and it mentioned biofeedback, and I used biofeedback to help me get well. Uh, It had an amazing, very rapid effect in terms of turning my pain around. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I just became interested in optimizing my health and feeling the best that I could. And uh, for the last 35 years or so, I've been researching, experimenting personally, working with pain patients, and then, you know, for the last few years, researching my book about how people can get better from chronic pain. Do you know of any instances where biofeedback changes dramatically with marijuana use or any other type of pain treatment? Um, When we're doing brainwave biofeedback and looking at the brain, you will see a dampening effect on brain function with marijuana Mm -hmm. uh, where the brain slows down and, um, you know, if you use a lot of it, um, it can slow down cognitive processing. But um, when you use medical marijuana for the treatment of chronic pain, you're using very little. Um, very little, like one puff on a joint can eliminate pain uh, for hours. So you're talking about a very small amount. And you're also talking about, if you're talking about medical marijuana, you're talking about marijuana that's been bred to not have as much THC, Mm -hmm. which is the part that gets you high, and has more of the other cannabinoids, which are the Mm -hmm. pain-relieving parts of marijuana. So, And some people use um, straight CBD, which is one of the compounds in marijuana that has been shown to reduce pain. And, um, you know, you can orally administer it. You can uh, use it topically. You can vaporize it rather than burn it, which just releases the vapors of the beneficial components without having to have the toxins that come with smoking. So there's many ways to safely use uh, marijuana for pain that don't negatively affect your functioning and don't have any risks. So if I'm understanding correctly, Folks that are living in locales where they can legally obtain medical marijuana, if they can afford it, are getting marijuana that will get you high a lot less than, I guess, the illegal marijuana that's being sold in many more locales. Is is that what, what I'm understanding? 
Yes, because um, the illegal marijuana that you can get on the street, that's been bred for its psychoactive properties. You know, when people traditionally have used marijuana recreationally, what they want is the high. Mm -hmm. And that's not the part that is really helpful for pain, except that to a, to a small degree, pain comes with anxiety and depression, and the psychoactive properties of marijuana can help with anxiety and depression. So if you go to a legal marijuana dispensary, they have what's called different strains that have different amounts, balances of the psychoactive THC versus the CBD, which is the more pain-relieving mm -hmm. compound. And based on your condition and your needs, uh, you can select the strain that works best for you. Now, um, we were talking initially about some of the recent legislation, not only here in the United States concerning medical marijuana, but uh, in the United Kingdom and Australia as well. Let's talk about access to the medical marijuana patient in these locales. What would you say is the least obstructive as far as um, access to the drugs? Well, it's least obstructive in um, 29 states in the United States as of this week. Um, 29 states have approved medical marijuana. There's varying degrees of access in terms of how many roadblocks are put in place to people getting it. Uh, New York State is one of the worst. Um, you know, you need to find a doctor who'll prescribe it who has to be specially certified. You have to go in person to a dispensary. You can't figure out who the doctors are. Other states let you grow your own to a, you know, up to a certain amount. You can have so many marijuana plants that you grow yourself. So there's very wide variation. In the United Kingdom, there's virtually no access. Uh, there's a drug that's derived from, um, marijuana called Sativex and, um, only people with multiple sclerosis could get it. A lot of people in the United Kingdom were using uh, CBD products, which, as I mentioned earlier, the THC has been taken out, and it's purely the compounds that seem to help with chronic pain. Marijuana is an herb. It grows wild all over the planet, except in the coldest climates, and people were using these products um, until very recently in the U.K., and then the U.K., uh, within the last month or so, banned CBD products. They classified them as medicine, which, you know, sounds nice. Okay, the United Kingdom is accepting uh, marijuana components as medicines. But, in fact, what that does is now um, anybody, any organization that produces and sells CBD products must go through a drug approval process where they do clinical trials and prove that it's safe and effective for um, the condition that it's going to be used for. And that can cost hundreds of thousands to hundreds of millions of dollars. Wow. And, um, you know, it's ba basically out of reach of the, you know, the average company. So, in effect, access to medical marijuana and its derivatives has um, just ended in the United Kingdom. Well, let's talk about a couple of the of the problems that can be associated with the legalization of medical marijuana. Uh, you're in New York. What about people coming from other states into New York to attempt to get medical marijuana uh, that don't live in New York but still need it outside of New York? How does that work? Well, um, first of all, they'd have to find a doctor that was certified to prescribe it, uh, which is, as I said, difficult because there's no list. And then once they, I think they have to also apply to get certified as a patient. And then once they do that, they have to go to a dispensary in person. I think they just um, expanded it that, that um, dispensaries can deliver However, you know, they can only obviously deliver to New York addresses. And then there's the problem, if you could get it, of taking it back to your home state. Because if marijuana is illegal in your home state, um, you can get arrested for possession. 
And in New York State, uh, small amounts of even recreational marijuana, uh, possession of an ounce or less, is um, is considered a violation. You can get a fine. Wow. But in other states, like Texas, for instance, possession of an ounce of marijuana can get you serious jail time. So, you know, the, the real problem with going out of state to get it is... Um, getting arrested for possession in your home state. Now, do you see um, the other states coming on board with these 29 states that have uh, approved medical marijuana? Well, I think that a lot of people who are advocates for medical marijuana are saying now that this election was the turning point. Uh, Some states added uh, recreational marijuana. Anybody could buy it. Um, and it's not a criminal offense. Other states have added medical marijuana. So uh, I think it's becoming more widespread. The first southern states in the United States um, have legalized medical marijuana. Up to now, it's mainly northeastern and west coast states. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first southern states, Florida and Arkansas, just legalized medical marijuana. And I just want to mention that when a state legalizes marijuana, uh, for medical purposes, it's still going to be probably at least a couple years down the road before people could actually get it, uh, because okay. all sorts of regulations have to be put in place. Um, doctors have to be certified. Sellers have to be certified. Their products have to be approved. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a it's a long process. Now, in wrapping up, Cindy, let's uh, let's tell our listeners where they can get more information about some of the recent legislation here in the United States and also a copy of your book, the best-selling Amazon book, The Truth About Chronic Pain Treatments, The Best and Worst Strategies for Becoming Pain-Free. Okay, well, in terms of the status of uh, medical marijuana and recreational marijuana laws, there's a website Uh, There's a national organization for the reform of marijuana laws, and they have a website, normal.org. It's N-O-R-M-L.org, and um, they have a state-by-state breakdown of what the laws are, and they keep it pretty up-to-date. You can search by your own state. My book, uh, The Truth About Chronic Pain Treatments, is available on Amazon. You can also order it through your local bookstore, or get it on barnesandnoble.com. And if people go to my website, uh, becomingpainfree.com, uh, they can also get more information about the book. They can also get a free uh, download, the five best self-help tools for becoming pain-free. Because uh, don't despair if you can't get medical marijuana. There's lots of other things that can help you with chronic pain that you haven't tried yet. Mm-hmm. And all of them are mentioned in my book. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you today, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk with you, too. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, with Cindy Perlin, licensed clinical social worker and author of the best-selling book, The Truth About Chronic Pain Treatments, The Best and Worst Strategies for Becoming Pain-Free. We've been talking about some of the recent legislation in the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia, and how that recent legislation affects patient access to medical marijuana. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and also at hpr.fm, and you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes.